Good evening aspirants, welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 23rd of December 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles we will be going through today. Now, without wasting time, let's start our discussion. Let us start today's discussion with this editorial article. As per the article, WTO panel report says that the United States is turning away from free trade and moving towards protectionism. This is because the USA recently imposed a tariff of 25% and 10% on steel and aluminium respectively. And also recently, the WTO panel has ruled that the tariff imposed by USA on steel and aluminium are inconsistent with the WTO law. This is the crux of the editorial given here. In this context, let us see the important points mentioned in the editorial. Also, we will see about WTO. Before getting into that, I have highlighted the syllabus regarding this discussion. You can go through it. Now let's start our discussion. Let us start by looking into WTO. We all know the expansion of WTO, right? It is the World Trade Organization. But do you know the history of WTO? Do you know how it came into being? It all started with the end of the World War II. See the irony, no? End of the World War II started the mark of WTO. The Second World War offered the Allied powers an opportunity to remake the world. So, they devised many international organizations which resembled the structure of national governments. This is new to us, right? We have all seen the international organizations as a means for cooperation between different countries in the world. But they were formulated as structures which resembled the structure of the national governments of the allied powers. Think about it now. There is a legislature which is nothing but the General Assembly of the United Nations. Then there is the judiciary which is nothing but the International Court of Justice. A central bank which is World Bank and IMF and an executive which is nothing but the United Nations Security Council. Now you know how these organizations were created. Not only this, the architects of the post-war also established institutions which were equivalents of many ministries. For example, we have Food and Agriculture Organization which resembles the Ministry of Agriculture. For Education and Culture, we have UNESCO. For Health, we have WHO. Look at how the order of the world after the World War II was created. Like this, organization which was envisaged for the trade is known as International Trade Organization. It was intended to perform the functions of a global trade ministry. These organizations were formed in the hope that all these organizations will create a world government. But it didn't happen because countries have strong attachments to their own sovereignty. Let us not deviate from the topic of our interest today. So, coming back to WTO, sorry, ITO. During the sovereignty problem and tensions which emerged because of Cold War, international trade organization is subjected to many criticism. In Havana, in 1948, the UN Conference on Trade and Employment concluded a draft charter for the ITO, which is known as the Havana Charter. But this charter was not signed by the US. So, side by side, countries relied temporarily on the GATT agreement for phasing out use of import quota and reducing tariff. The expansion of GATT is General Agreement on Trade and Tariff. And this GATT became the centerpiece of the trading system for an interim period. It was done in the hope that ITO will be revamped and it will come into existence with reforms. But nothing happened. So, the interim period of GATT became nearly half a century. See, GATT was created in 1947 and WTO came into existence in the year 1995. So, like I said, nearly half a century, GATT dominated the trade worldwide. GATT held many negotiations. During the GATT years, eight rounds of tariff negotiations were held between 1947 and 1994. I have given those details here. You can go through it. Now, you may ask, if countries relied on GATT for so long, then what necessitated the formation of WTO? See, everything will have some imperfections, right? So, GATT also had some shortcomings. GATT was a contract to which countries were parties. It is not an organization in which countries are members. So, what does this mean? This means that in a contractual agreement, the commitments were applied on a provisional rather than definitive basis. So, this only necessitated the formation of an organization. Apart from this, 
the last round of GATT, which is the Uruguay round, also necessitated the formation of an organization. The talks were to extend the trading system into several new areas. For example, trade in services and intellectual property. And there were also talks to reform the trade in the sensitive sectors of agriculture and textiles. So, this round is ironically called as the round to end all rounds. Okay. And now coming back. WTO began on 1st January 1995. Even though it was created in 1995, the GATT had been providing rules since 1948. One more thing that you should note is that GATT mainly dealt with trade in goods. But the WTO and its agreements also cover trade in services and intellectual property. The birth of the WTO also created new procedures for the settlement of disputes. For services, we have general agreement on trade in services which is GATS. For IPR, we have Agreement on Trade Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, which is TRIPS. For Dispute Settlement, we have Dispute Settlement Understanding. Other agreements are also there, but we will see about them in some other day. And this is all about WTO's history. Now we will see the organizational structure of WTO. The WTO has 164 members. This accounts for 98% of world trade. The WTO is run by its member governments. All the major decisions are taken by the membership as a whole. The decisions are made either by ministers or by their ambassadors or delegates. But know that the decisions are normally taken by consensus. And the WTO's agreements have been ratified in all member parliaments. WTO's top level decision making body is the ministerial conference which meets usually every two years. And below this is the general council. And this General Council meets several times a year in the Geneva headquarters. The General Council also meets as the Trade Policy Review Body and the Dispute Settlement Body. At the next level, there is the Goods Council, Service Council and the Intellectual Property Council. They all report to the General Council. Apart from this, numerous specialized committees, working groups and working parties are also there. They all deal with the individual agreements and other areas such as environment, development, membership publication and regional trade agreements. Now this might give you an idea about the functioning of WTO. What is the core objective of WTO? It is the trade opening, right? It aids in smooth and free flow of trade. So what will be the functions of WTO? The functions of WTO include administrating trade agreements, acting as the forum for trade negotiation, settling trade disputes reviewing national trade policies, building the trade capacity of developing economies and cooperating with other international organizations. This is about the objectives and functions of WTO. Now coming to the editorial. The editorial says that the world is shifting from neoliberalism to geoeconomic order. Particularly, this is seen in the case of USA and China. For your better understanding, I will explain this in simple terms. After the Cold War, the world was interested in neoliberalism. Now, what is this neoliberalism? In the neoliberal order, the economic and security interests are independent tracks. Neoliberalism is based on principles such as non-discrimination in international economic relation, that is free trade, peaceful settlement of disputes through neutral international courts. These principles are achieved through the creation of global institutions such as WTO, and a large number of free trade and investment treaties. This was the case immediately after the Cold War. This is because at that time, the US existed as an undisputed hegemon, that is undisputed power. And it supported free trade because it did not fear the growth of any strategic rivals such as China. But now, like I said, countries are moving towards geo-economic order. This means that the world order is based on economic position of the countries. Do you understand this? See, if a country is wealthy, it is a major economic power, then the country is seen as a powerful country. This is because only when they are able to buy and develop weapons, they can protect their territory and sovereignty very well. Do you notice the change here? In neoliberalism, security never crossed paths with economy. They remained as independent tracks, like the railway track. But in geo-economic order, these independent tracks, that is, economic and security tracks, they started to converge. The main reason for this is the fear. Yeah, you heard me right. Like we saw before, when US was an undisputed and incomparable power, it agreed to free trade. 
but as the gap in size of chinese and american economies begin to shrink at a rapid pace the us is giving up on free trade okay and also us is swiftly or quickly embracing protectionism and the tariff increased by us on steel and aluminum is seen as one such measure initially we saw about wto panel reports right do you remember that in that report us was accused of violating article 2 class 1 of gatt article 2 class 1 obligates the countries not to impose tariff beyond certain rates but for this the us justified that their action is as per article 21 of gatt this allows the countries to deviate from their trade obligation on grounds of national security specifically article 21 class b sub class 3 of gatt allows the country to take any action which is necessary for the protection of security in time of war or other emergency in international relations but for this the panel said that the national security rule of article 21 is not entirely self judging it is subjected to review so as per the review the panel rejected the uss argument that it increased the tariff due to global excess capacity and it also rejected us argument that the global excess capacity could lead to excessive imports used in defense production so compromising us's national security the panel held that the situation does not constitute as emergency in international relations under article 21 class b sub class 3 this is because it lacked severity the main takeaway for us is that a particular country can deviate from their trade obligation on grounds of national security and this action is subjected to review this is the example quoted by the author for explaining the move towards geo economic order the funny fact here is that usually us will only lecture countries to follow international law the us has constantly blamed china and russia for violating international law but us is also turning its back to the rule based order see the major concern about pursuing geo economic order is that this will encourage other countries to pursue unilateralism and economic nationalism as we all know unilateralism is the reminiscent of the first part of the 20th century that led to the great depression and the second world war so the author is saying that excessively following economic nationalism is also dangerous to the prosperity of the world because in some cases it may trigger war between countries so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the evolution of wto its objectives and functions after that we saw how the world order is changing from neoliberal to geo economic order and we understood this with the example of the trade war between china and usa so that's all regarding this discussion i hope this discussion was useful with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article have a look at this news article this news article talks about a gang attack the news is that a four member gang including three juveniles attacked eight persons across kanchipuram and it is said that they were under the influence of alcohol see this news is not relevant for our exam but the issue of juvenile delinquency is very relevant for our examination so in this context in our discussion today let us see about juveniles and what is meant by juvenile delinquency then we will also see what are all the possible reasons for juvenile delinquency in india first of all who is a juvenile juvenile or a child is a person who has not completed 18 years of age this is what is said in section 2 class k of juvenile justice care and protection of children act 2015 now what is juvenile delinquency juvenile delinquency refers to participation of minors in illegal crimes when a person deviates from the normal course of his social life his behavior is termed as delinquent in other words when a juvenile's action proved to be dangerous towards a society and for him he may be called as a juvenile delinquent the act of delinquency may include running away from home use of inappropriate or vulgar language committing sexual offense etc so juvenile delinquency is nothing but juvenile crime to understand this term you can think about the movie pudupete starring dhanush in that movie during his engage itself he will be accustomed to violence at his home actually in that movie his father kills his mother and dhanush will witness it so he will run away from home then he will fall into the hands of the drug crime industry in northern chennai and in turn he becomes a don so due to some issues in his house he ended up becoming a juvenile delinquent and further expanding into 
major crimes. This is about juvenile delinquency. Okay. With this understanding, let us see the reasons behind juvenile delinquency. Firstly, if the parents are abusive, then the core character of the child itself is varied because the minor would not have received proper education. So, they have lower intelligence and are more likely to be involved in delinquent behavior. This is the first reason. Secondly, if the child has faced family violence or sexual abuse, this might alter their behavior. So, this will lead to their involvement in criminal activities. The third important thing is substance abuse. Substance abuse like drug abuse, antisocial peer groups, easy availability of firearms, all these factors will push a child towards delinquency. So in short, we can say that the three factors causing juvenile delinquency in India are family factors, individual factors and substance abuse factors. So these are all the reasons for juvenile delinquency behavior. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we first saw who is a juvenile, then we saw who is a juvenile delinquent. Finally, we saw the reason behind juvenile delinquency. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this article from the opinion page. This article talks about judicial vacation. Now, suddenly, this is a news because of the announcement made by the Chief Justice of India. He said that the vacation benches of the Supreme Court will not be available during the winter break. This announcement came after the Union Law Minister's criticism of the court's lengthy vacation and the inconvenience it caused to the litigants. In this background, this interview article in the opinion page of the newspaper tries to address the need of the judicial vacation. So in our discussion today, we will see what is judicial vacation, the provisions that allow for judicial vacation and the need for judicial vacation. Okay. The syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here. You can go through it. Now let's start our discussion. Let us begin with the question, what is this court or judicial vacation? The Supreme Court has 193 working days a year for its judicial functioning, while the high courts functions for approximately 210 days and the trial courts for 245 days. High courts have the power to structure their calendars according to their service rules. Now specifically talking about the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court breaks its seven week annual summer vacation and takes it as a summer and winter break. The summer break or summer vacation begins at the end of May and the court reopens in July. After that, the court takes a week long break each for Dasara and Diwali as well as a two week break at the end of December. This is the winter break and this is how the court vacation functions. Now moving on to the question. What is the need for court vacation? Firstly, vacation gives time for rejuvenation. India has the most overburdened judiciary. I am saying this because there is a huge workload on working days from Monday to Friday. Every year, approximately 25,000 cases are filed. If this is the situation, then the Supreme Court will have to hear at least 50 to 75 cases per day. Judges cannot discharge justice without having read the papers to pass appropriate orders, right? So, just look at the workload. If the judiciary doesn't have the vacation, the judges will have mental breakdown. So, the vacations provide the rejuvenation time that the judges need to function effectively during the working days. This is the first need for court vacation. The second reason is that we cannot compare court to other arms of the democracy like the executive and the legislature. I am saying this because judges do not take leave of absence like other working professional when the court is in session. Family tragedies, health are very rare exception. But judges rarely take the day off for social engagements. For this reason, court vacations are a need. Thirdly, since every case has its own complex issues, in reality, it takes time and effort to read, comprehend, and assess the case. So, the legal fraternity that is the court and the advocates argue that the time during vacation is also utilized for writing judgments and doing research regarding the case. Just now we saw about the workload, right? I hope you can understand the judges are left with very little time when the courts are working to do this research regarding the cases. Okay? Finally, the argument that cutting the vacation period would be a solution to pendency is not backed by data. 
as pendency relates largely to legacy cases that need to be tackled very systematically. We cannot expect the judiciary to work round the clock and expect them to deliver high quality judgments. Here, let me give you an example. Our Supreme Court website shows that the court gives minimum of 10 to 15 judgments per day. On the other hand, the US federal courts give a maximum of 10 to 15 judgments a year. So, it is a universally accepted system that if you want efficacy, you have to give the judges the proper time to get ready to give a proper judgment. So, these are all the reasons that necessitates the presence of or the provision of court vacation. Okay? Now, you may ask me a question. What will happen to the important cases during court vacation? It seems like the Supreme Court is taking two long vacations each year. But technically, the court is not fully closed during these vacations. Generally, a few judges are available for hearing urgent cases even when the court is in recess. There will be a combination of two or three judges called vacation benches. This vacation bench of the Supreme Court is a special bench constituted by the Chief Justice of India. During vacations, litigants can still approach the Supreme Court and if the court decides that the plea is an urgent matter, then the vacation bench hears the cases on its merit. It is not very uncommon for court to hear important cases during vacation. For example, in 2015, a five-bed judge of Supreme Court heard the challenge of the Constitution Amendment setting up the NJAC, that is National Judicial Appointments Commission. Then in 2017, a constitution bench led by the then CJA J.S. Kelkar held a six-day hearing of the case challenging the practice of triple talaq during the summer vacation. So, it is not very uncommon for the court to even work during the vacation. So, the executive must not blame the Supreme Court or the judiciary in general for the pendency of case and link it to the court vacation. Okay? I hope you can understand. So, finally, let us see the legal provisions that facilitates for this vacation benches. See, Rule 6 of Order 2 of the Supreme Court Rule 2013 empowers the Chief Justice of India to nominate the division benches. They hear urgent miscellaneous matters and regular hearing matters during the summer vacation for the period. And whenever necessary, he may even appoint a division court. This court can hear urgent cases during the vacation which require to be heard by a bench of judges. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw what is court vacation. Then we saw four points that discusses the need for court vacation. Then we saw what is vacation bench and how we effective the court functions even during vacation. And finally, we saw the legal provisions that enables the provision for vacation benches. So that's all regarding this discussion. Now with this, let us conclude this and take up the next news article. Have a look at this editorial article. This article is written by Mr. M.K. Narayanan, who needs no introduction. This article talks about the issue of terrorism. In the introduction, he writes about the recent global initiatives to counter terrorism. Then he writes about the major terrorist activities that took place after 2000. He also says that for the past couple of years, there has not been any major terrorist attack. He says that this is not something to be happy about since the terror networks are still functioning and could strike at any time. He is of the opinion that the world nations are not working towards waging a coordinated fight against terrorism. For example, we can take India and Pakistan. Both the countries are among the most affected by terrorism. But they blame each other instead of finding ways to cooperate to deal with the issue of terrorism. In the final part of the editorial, Mr. M. K. Narayanan suggests certain measures that can be taken to counter terrorism. In this, he mainly focuses on reactivating the Comprehensive Convention on International Terrorism. So, in our discussion today, we will focus on CCIT, that is Comprehensive Convention on International Terrorism. Now, what is this CCIT? This Comprehensive Convention on International Terrorism was proposed by India to the United Nations General Assembly and this was in the year 1996. India did this with the objective of providing a comprehensible legal framework to counter terrorism. Okay, this is the basic introduction. Now let us see the major objectives of this CCIT. First objective is to have a universal definition of terrorism. 
and this has to be adopted by all 193 members of the United Nations General Assembly into their own criminal laws. Okay, now comes the question. What was the definition given by CCIT for terrorism? According to this convention, if any person commits an offence with the purpose of frightening a population or if the offence is to compel a government or an international organisation to abstain from doing their duty and if these offences causes death or sometimes serious bodily injury to any person or serious damage to public or private property, then this is the definition given by the convention to define terrorism. Okay? Now, let us come back to the objectives. The second objective of the convention is to ban all terror groups and shut down terror camps. The third objective is to prosecute all terrorists under special laws. And the last objective is to make cross-border terrorism an extraditable offence worldwide. Here, an offence is extraditable if it is a crime in both the countries and punishable by imprisonment for a period of one year or more. Okay? Now, these are the objectives of the CCIT. We could see that its objectives brings in the theme of coordinated fight against terrorism. But what are the issues with this convention that keeps it just at the proposal level? The conclusion and the ratification of CCIT remains deadlocked due to opposition from three main blocks of countries. Who are they? They are the United States, the Organization of Islamic Countries and the Latin American countries. Now we will see the rationale behind the opposition by these groups to the CCIT. Firstly, let us take United States and the issue that US has against CCIT. The United States wanted the draft to exclude acts committed by military forces of states during peacetime because it is worried about the application of the CCIT to its own military forces. This is because of US involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq. Secondly, let us see about the issue mentioned by OIC, that is Organization of Islamic Countries. The OIC wants exclusion of national liberation movements. This is mainly in the context of Israel-Palestine conflict. And according to OIC, there is a need to distinguish acts of terrorism from movements of self-determination, so that legitimate movements are not labelled as criminal acts of terrorism. This is the issue cited by OIC. And lastly, let us see the issue cited by Latin American countries. The Latin American countries wanted the draft to cover state terrorism also. Then it also wanted to include the violation of international human rights law by state under terrorism. So, from the issue cited by these three group of countries, we can see that their main concern is regarding the definition of terrorism provided under CCIT. So, Mr. M. K. Narayanan is of the opinion that CCIT should have to be brought back to the table and the issues surrounding the definition of terrorism should be sorted out so that CCIT can be implemented. He is of the opinion that only if the CCIT is implemented, coordinated action worldwide against terrorism can be mooted and this will only lead to long-term solution to counter the act of terrorist attacks. Okay. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the major points highlighted in the editorial. Then we saw about CCIT and the issues surrounding it. So with this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this editorial. The war between Russia and Ukraine seems never ending. More than 300 days have passed since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We have discussed so many times about the causes of the war. But this editorial talks about another aspect. It provides us with a testament of the role played by USA in this war. Don't you wonder what this superpower is doing in this war? Let us find out. Before that, note down the syllabus here. Now let's start. Who do you think USA will be supporting? Those who even know a little bit about international relations and the Cold War can easily say USA will be on the opposing side of Russia. So yes, USA is obviously supporting Ukraine in this war. USA-Ukraine bilateral relations dates back to 1991, when Ukraine got independence from the Soviet Union. USA also plays a critical role in supporting the enhanced engagement between NATO and Ukraine. On these lines, when the war began, USA started supporting Ukraine saying it wanted to maintain international order. USA's Secretary of State openly mentioned, help Ukraine defend itself, support the Ukrainian people, hold Russia accountable. So, what kind of support am I talking about here? 
Is it sanctions on Russia? No. I am talking about other types of help. For example, in March, USA enacted Ukraine Supplemental Appropriations Act. This act provided $13.6 billion assistance in terms of military, humanitarian and economic assistance. Objective here was to help Ukraine. Also, objective here was to help Ukraine to defend itself from Russia's further invasion, also ensuring effective functioning of the government of Ukraine and to support its people. Here, focus on the term to defend itself. How can a country in a war defend itself? Only through weapons, right? This is where the military assistance comes into play. Because in the assistance, a total of $1 billion as security assistance is approved to provide Ukraine with weapons so that it can effectively defend itself from Russian invasion. Additionally, USA and allies consisting of 50 nations have committed military equipment to strengthen Ukraine. This includes nearly 2,000 tanks and other armored vehicles, more than 800 artillery systems, more than 50 advanced multiple rocket launching system and also anti-ship and air defense systems. Like this, military and security assistance have been provided by USA time and again. One was granted just two days ago based on which the editorial has been written. This assistance includes an additional security assistance of $1.85 billion for Ukraine. It includes many military capabilities like one Patriot air defense system, additional ammunition for high mobility artillery rocket system that is HIMARS okay here Patriot air defense system holds importance let us see about it now first note that Patriot is expanded as phased array tracking radar to intercept on target such a tough name but we know it is an air defense system it is a surface to air mobile air defense missile system it is capable of bringing down cruise missiles, short-range ballistic missiles and aircraft. So it is one of world's most advanced air defense capabilities. Its concept was first developed in 1961, so it has gone through many upgradations over the years. The system has four operational functions, namely communication, command and control, radar surveillance and missile guidance. For these, the system consists of six major components. The components are missiles or interceptors, launcher, radar set, control station, power generator unit and high frequency antenna mast. Here the capability of the system depends on the type of interceptor used. For example, Patriot uses PAC-2 interceptor and also PAC-3 missile. The PAC-2 interceptor is proximity fusing missile and uses a blast fragmentation warhead that is BFW. The warhead refers to the explosive head of the missile. In proximity fusing, the missile detonates automatically when it approaches a target, that is, when it is in the proximity of the target. The missile detonates. In other words, it detonates in the vicinity of the threat missile. Also, in blast fragmentation warhead, detonation delivers damage to the target due to shock wave and metal splinters. On the other hand, PAC-3 missile uses advanced hit-to-kill technology, that is, HTK technology. HTK defeats targets by striking them directly. So, PAC-3 strikes the target whereas PAC-2 detonates near it. There are many differences in both technologies. HTK ensures minimization of lethal effects on the ground. But BFW has a better chance of hitting the body of the ballistic missiles. Whereas HTK demands a guidance system to ensure body-to-body -body contact between the interceptor and the incoming ballistic missile. But with advanced technologies, guidance is achieved now. Particularly, HTK is much effective where the enemy missile has submunitions. Submunitions are small weapons or devices that is part of the larger warhead and separates from it prior to impact. In case of HTK weapons, they deliver more destructive energy than even the most efficient BFW. Also, BFW lacks sufficient penetration to destroy submunitions. In this image you can see in HTK 91% submunitions is killed whereas BFW kills only 26%. So this means when submunitions are involved BFW fails to protect the defendant target and has lethal effects on the ground. This is why HTK that is hit to kill are preferred. So PAC-3 is more advanced and more effective in neutralizing air targets than 
PAC2. Okay. One of the advantage of the Patriot air defense system is it has both the interceptors. That is PAC2, which is a BFW, and PAC3, which is HTK. Okay. This is one of the major advantages associated with Patriot system. Next is the launcher station. They transport and protect the interceptor missiles and provide platform for their physical launch of the missile. Not only this, the Patriot radar combines surveillance, tracking and engagement functions in one unit. The radar has an effective range of 150 kilometers. Since Patriot has a phased array radar, as its name suggests, it helps to guide interceptors to their target and it is also resistant to jamming. Note that control station is the only manned component of the Patriot system. It calculates trajectories for interceptors and controls the launching sequence. Also communicates with the launcher station and other Patriot batteries. Here battery means artillery. And finally the antenna mast group is the main communications backbone for the Patriot unit. Based on these capabilities of Patriot, it is currently in use worldwide including several NATO countries. Now, it is given to Ukraine. Depending of capabilities of Patriot, you can assume that Patriot will be a deterrent to Russia. This is also a problem because now Russia will be enraged and may carry out more heavier attacks on Ukraine. If this happens, it will be against the stand of USA, which is to avoid provoking a wider war. So, the author of this editorial suggests a diplomatic solution to de-escalate the situation between Russia and Ukraine. The solution the author proposes is USA taking lead and hosting direct negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. This will not only end the war but also prevent future escalation. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw the role played by USA in the Russia-Ukraine war. We also saw about the important points about Patriot air defense system. With this, let us conclude this and take up the next news article. Now take a look at this news article. This news article mentioned about government's plan to roll out vaccination against cervical cancer for girls aged between 9 and 14 through school. This decision was based on the National Technical Advisory Group for Immunization recommendation to introduce HPV vaccine in the Universal Immunization Program. This is about the news article given here. In this context, let us quickly go through cervical cancer and the Seravac vac vaccine. Let us start with cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is a type of cancer that occurs in the cells of the cervix. Cervix is the lower part of the uterus that connects to the vagina. Various strains of human papilloma virus, a sexually transmitted infection, plays a role in causing most cervical cancer. When exposed to HPV, the body's immune system mainly prevents the virus from doing harm. In a small percentage of people alone, however, the virus survives for years contributing to the process that causes some cervical cells to become cancer cells. Environment and our lifestyle choices also determine whether we will be developing cervical cancer or not. Now let us see the symptoms of the cervical cancer. In the early stage, cervical cancer generally produces no signs or symptoms. Signs and symptoms of more advanced cervical cancer include vaginal bleeding after sexual intercourse, watery, bloody, vaginal discharge and pelvic pain or pain during intercourse. These are the common symptoms of cervical cancer. Remember, you can reduce the risk of developing cervical cancer by having screening test and receiving a vaccine that protects against HPV infection. Now, we are very concerned about that cervical cancer because cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer in women globally. In India, cervical cancer is the second most common cancer in women. India contributes to the largest share of global cervical cancer burden. According to a recent study published in The Lancet, India accounted for nearly 1 in 4 deaths globally due to cervical cancer. Considering all this only, India's first indigenously developed quadrivalent human papilloma virus vaccine for the prevention of cervical cancer was announced in September 2022. The name of the vaccine is Servavac. The vaccine is based on VLP, that is virus-like particles similar to hepatitis B vaccination. And it gives protection by producing antibodies against HPV's L1 protein. The VLPs have the same outer L1 protein codes as HPV. But the VLPs do not contain any genetic material. 
the vaccine uses these VLPs as antigen to induce a strong protective immune response. If an exposure occurs, the vaccinated person's antibodies against the L1 protein will coat the virus and prevent it from releasing its genetic material. This is how the vaccine works. We saw that Servavac is a quadravalent vaccine, right? Quadravalent vaccine is nothing but a vaccine that works by stimulating the immune response against four different antigens, such as four different viruses or four different variants of the virus. That is, this vaccine is effective against at least four variants of the cancer-causing human papilloma virus. This quadravalent HPV vaccine works against type 6, 11, 16 and 18. Here you have to know that there are many type of HPV like 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52 and 58. All these types are high risk for cancer. And here type 6 and 11 are considered low risk types. So basically this type of quadravalent HPV vaccine provides protection against type 6, type 11, type 16 and type 18 of the HPV virus. Okay. Remember this Indian made HPV vaccine Servavac is developed by Department of Biotechnology Industry Research Assistant Council and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This vaccine should be given in two doses for the 9 to 14 year olds and for three doses for the 15 to 26 year olds. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about cervical cancer and the symptoms of cervical cancer. Then we also saw about indigenous vaccine that is Servavac which provides protection against cervical cancer. So with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Have a look at this news article. This news article talks about the Battle of Vandivash. See, Battle of Vandivash is the part of the Third Carnatic War. So, in this discussion, we will focus on the Third Carnatic War. First, why was the name Carnatic War given to this specific war? Actually, all the three Carnatic Wars, that is the First Carnatic War, Second Carnatic War and the Third Carnatic War were basically Anglo-French War. But why the name? This is because the English and the French called the hinterland of the Coromandel coast as the Carnatic region. Since all the wars took place in this region, these three wars are called as the Carnatic wars. Let us focus in this discussion specifically on the third Carnatic war. What caused the war? The main cause of the war is the seven year war which started in Europe. Actually, when the seven year war started in Europe, there was not much fighting between French and the English in India. But after the Battle of Plassey of 1957, the British took control of the French portion of Chandranagur. So, this triggered the war between British and French in India. The main general in the side of British is Sir Ayercourt and in the side of French is Count de Lally. The major battle that was part of this war is the Battle of Vandivash. It was fought in an area called Vandavasi in Tamil Nadu and the result of the battle is Sir Ayercourt defeated County Lally of French. See, the Battle of Vandivash is one of the significant war of India but it is rarely noticed. It is actually as significant as Battle of Plassey and Battle of Buxar. This is because Battle of Buxar effectively ended the Mughal administration in India. Likewise, Battle of Vandivash effectively ended the French ambitions in India. After the Battle of Vandivash and at the end of the Third Carnatic War, the Treaty of Paris was signed between British and the French. After the Treaty of Paris, the British gave back the territory of Puducherry and Chandranagur back to French. But on the condition that the French remain as the trading country in India rather than as a regional power. So, at the end of the Third Carnatic War, the English effectively became the only European country with military ambitions in India and this started the colonization of India. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about the third Carnatic war and the significance of the battle of Vandivash. With this let us conclude the news article discussion session and take up the practice prelims questions. We have six practice prelims questions today. Let us see them one by one. Let us take up the first question. See before seeing the question I have displayed here a news article this news article is regarding the recent announcement of Sahitya Akademi Awards. 
for people who are preparing for state public service commission exams just pass the video and look at the winners and try to note it down there might be a definite question from this in your examination as far as upsc is concerned the question will not be about the winners but the question will be about the sahitya academy so i have made a question so let us see that question look at this question it is a two statement question about the sahitya academy let us take up the first statement sahitya academy is the first among the three academies established by the government of india to encourage cultural activities in india see this statement is wrong actually the first academy to be established by government of india is the sangeet natak academy okay after that sahitya academy was established and finally lalit kala academy was established so statement 1 is wrong look at statement 2 Sahitya Academy is also called as the India's National Academy of Music, Dance and Drama. This statement is wrong. Actually, Sangeet Natak Academy is also called as India's National Academy of Music, Dance and Drama. Since both these statements are wrong, the correct answer here is option D, neither one nor two. Moving on to the second question, it is also a two statement question about Juvenile Justice Care and Protection of Children Act 2015. Let us take up the first statement. This act repealed the Juvenile Delinquency Law and Juvenile Justice Care and Protection of Children Act 2000. Actually this statement is correct. The 2015 act actually replaced the 2000 act. Okay, moving on to the second statement. The 2015 act offered provisions regarding adoption of abandoned children. This statement is also correct. Since both the statements are correct, the correct answer here is option C, both 1 and 2. Moving on to the third question. It is a pair based question. in one side defense system are given and in other side country of origin is given we have to find how many pairs are correctly matched see from our discussion we know that patriot originated in usa so second pair is correct and the third pair is also correct s400 is from russia the first one is wrong third defense system is not from israel but it is from usa okay since they are asking for incorrectly matched pairs the first one is alone incorrectly matched so only one pair is incorrectly matched so the correct answer here is option a only one pair moving on to the fourth question this question is in reference to cervical cancer two statements are given and we have to find the correct statement cervical cancer is hereditary this statement is wrong moving on to the second statement it is caused by epstein barr virus this is also wrong as we saw in our discussion cervical cancer is caused by human papilloma virus so since both the statements are wrong the correct answer is option d none of the above moving on to the fifth question this question is also a two statement question about battle of arcot let us take up the first statement it is part of the second carnatic war this statement is correct the second statement robert clive was called the hero of arcot this statement is also correct so the correct answer here is option c both 1 and 2 This is the quiz question for today. It is about Comprehensive Convention on International Terrorism. It is a very easy question. Interested aspirant can post the answer for this question in the comment section. The main questions based on today's discussion are displayed here. Interested aspirants can write the answers and post it in the comment section. If you like today's video, like, comment and share it with your friends. For more updates regarding UPSC preparation, subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.